Welcome to Chase Oaks. We are so glad that you are here before we dive into a brand new series that I am so excited to begin. Uh, I think it would be appropriate for us to uh, say a prayer uh, for the world. We, we can't ignore what's happening all around the world. And, and I'm not a, a politically charged person whatsoever, but I am a praying person. And I think that these are the times that the church can really be the church. And one of the things that, that we can do well is is we can pray. So if you would, uh, join me uh, as we pray. God, I thank you so much uh, for um, the opportunity, the freedom to uh, express our worship here. Lord, we don't take even just those smallest things for granted. Um, God, you can see what's happening in Ukraine right now. And God, I pray that you would give uh, world leaders so much wisdom. God, I pray that you would even be raising up godly men and women uh, to be in world leadership. And uh, God, I pray for the people of Ukraine. Uh, I pray, God, that you would give them strength during this time and that you would continue um, to... I pray, God, that they would just somehow, <laughs> in the middle of a literal war, that they would somehow send your peace. In Jesus' name we pray. Everybody said, Amen. 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 Um, we are starting off a brand new series called Grown Up Faith. The reason we're doing that is because uh, each and every one of us has had some sort of uh, religious experience that has led us to a place of why we believe what we believe or why we don't believe what we believe. I grew up African American Methodist Episcopal Church, okay? AME, okay? African Methodist Episcopal simply means it was a black church. Okay, that's what that means in case you're wondering, like, what does it mean? Now, I knew what it meant to be African. Okay, I knew that part. I had no idea what it meant to be Methodist or Episcopal. Okay, I, I just knew we had really long church services. We had choirs that wore robes and we sang out of hymnals. And so um, when I'm 12 years old and trying to reconcile for me, what does my faith look like? What does it mean to be a person that follows Jesus? It means you sing in the choir, and it also means that you love three-hour church services. And if, you're, if you want to get out of there after an hour, you're not spiritual anymore. Like, that was was my experience. Now, uh, some people, like, they, they didn't grow up in church whatsoever, but they, they grew up with some sort of experiences with another church person or a group of people. Some people were dragged to church by their parents. Some of them were dragged to church by their grandparents. You may have been dragged to church here right now. Uh, on some level, uh, you, you can have this sort of religious experience, and then you kind of wake up one day, and you kind of go, what in the heavens is going on? How did I get here? What do, what, do I, what do I actually believe? And sometimes what can happen is our faith can actually be derailed. Things can happen in our life. Bad things can happen to good people to make you go, I I'm not really sure what I believe. There there's a couple things that can really derail your faith. One of those things is church hurt which is not really church hurt. It's really just people hurt. They just kind of go to a place that we can kind of put them in a category. But sometimes instead of going to that person and saying, you hurt me, we'd rather say, all of y'all hurt me. Well, that's actually not true. It was actually one, maybe two, maybe three people. But especially if you find yourself ever making some mistakes and people turn their backs on you and you kind of go, it could just make you kind of disillusioned with church, faith, and you kind of put it all in the same category and go, I I'm just, I don't really know what to believe about God anymore. Oh, for some people, the thing that can derail their faith is actually hypocrisy, especially with Christian leaders. If, if you have found um, a Christian leader that has some sort of moral failure, which um, moral failure is kind of an interesting phrase which really uh, in, they, they slept with somebody and like I don't know what the other moral failures are there's only like two or three things that go into the category but we're like it's a moral failure we don't know what it is we know what it is buddy we know what it is now nevertheless um there was a Christian leader that you thought was something and then you found out that that wasn't true that they didn't have the highest level of integrity and you thought well if if they're a fraud then everything I believe must Crumble, that can really derail your faith. Now, um, you wanna know what else really can derail your faith? Unanswered prayer. 
unanswered prayer. If you've ever prayed for a child that is terminally ill and doesn't recover, you can find yourself going, what in the world am I even doing? Not just unanswered prayer, unanswered questions. If you've ever read the Bible and you didn't have questions, I don't think you were reading the Bible. I don't know what you're reading. Because there's, there's no way to read the Bible. There's no way to read Scripture and not have questions. And sometimes there are religious experiences that will not allow us to have questions. And so you have these unanswered questions, and you go, if I'm not allowed to ask questions, then I'm just, I'm out. Uh, something else that can often derail people's faith is, is distractions. It's not that you're not that spiritual. It's not that you even stop believing in God. You just like your job better. It consumes you. It takes up all of your time. Maybe it's money. Like you just have this obsession with trying to make as much of it before you go. And so all of a sudden you just don't really have time for your faith. And before you know it, you don't have any. Before you know it, what your faith is in is in you and your ability to create wealth, create influence. And so you just become so self-consumed. You just don't really have any space in your life for your faith. I don't know what else will derail a person's faith. Politics. I cannot tell you how many people I know who walked away from their faith during an election season. They just said, you know what? If this is what it means, I just... I'm done. Now, here's the deal. I, I wish I could go through each and every single one of these and go, hey, these are not great reasons to walk away from a heavenly father. Not one of them. However, these are very real experiences for a lot of people. And you might have grown up Catholic. You may have grown up Lutheran or, or Baptist or, you know, growing up African Methodist Episcopal all I knew was that it was a denomination. I found out that a denomination was kind of like a subtype of a Christian. And so any person that's not a Christian who hears about a Christian from a logical standpoint, given that there are over 13,000 denominations just in America, 45,000 Christian denominations around the world, okay? If, so if you tell somebody, I am a Christian, their logical response should be, well, what kind? Because you got 45,000 different options, and so it is very easy to wake up in your 30s, 40s, 50s, and 60s, and 70s and kind of go, well, what kind of Christian am I today? And so at some point, each and every one of us has to hit restart on our faith. This is why I love the series. It's grown-up faith. It's giving us an opportunity to go, you know what, I, how can I be a spiritually mature person and really know what I believe? There is a person in Scripture in John chapter 3. His name's Nicodemus. Nicodemus is awesome. Okay, He is a religious leader. This is a guy who is allegedly supposed to have his stuff together. He's the type of person that would say, I've got this whole God thing figured out. People look to me. Um, he's even called the teacher of Israel. Like, So he's the guy. And even he's kind of going, I don't know. But I've heard about this Jesus guy so I got to figure him out. Now, he's a part of this group called the Pharisees. The Pharisees are people that are trying to investigate Jesus. They're trying to kill Jesus. They're trying to get rid of Jesus. But Nicodemus is kind of on the outside of that group kind of going, guys, I don't know if he's as bad as you say he is, but I'm not sure that I fully understand him. And so in the middle of the night, he goes and visits Jesus, and they have one of the most iconic conversations you're going to find in Scripture. And so John 3, verse, verses 1 and 2, it says, Now there was a Pharisee, a man named Nicodemus, who was a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the signs you are doing if God were not with him. So, so right away, he, he's approaching Jesus going, I, can I talk to you for a second? I don't want anybody to know I'm here, but can we, 
can we just talk? I, I got a few, I just got a few questions. It, it, which should give us all hope. Because if you came here today, if you're watching today and you have questions, you've got good company, it means you're actually reading the Bible. I mean, listen, here's the deal. Anytime somebody tells you, hey, I'm going to save you, but I got to die first, but don't worry, I'm coming back in three days. You should have questions. <laughs> somebody tells you that, you should have a ton of questions. And Nicodemus is going, man, I clearly can see from your miracles. You're, you're, you, there's something about you that at least makes me curious. So, so tell me, Jesus, look, can, can I get a better understanding of who you are. In verse 3, Jesus says something very, very uncanny. He says, Jesus replied, Very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. In Jewish culture, there were lots of prophecies pointing to a Messiah. They were hoping Jesus was it. They were hoping that Jesus would be this person that would rule and reign and overthrow the Roman government. So there, there was a lot of teaching in Jewish culture that as long as you were born Jewish, as long as you were a descendant of Abraham, it gave you this lottery ticket into heaven. And so there was this idea, hey, uh, I, I'm, I'm actually already good based off of how I was born. To which Jesus goes, well, I got to shatter your whole idea of just because you were born a certain way and you've got this race thing going on. Yeah, that, that's not how it works. You, you actually got to be born again. It's like, wh wh what? Whoa, whoa, whoa. I, I thought, I thought I, we, we were God's favorite people. He's like, yeah, but uh, we're expanding the group. This thing is getting a lot bigger. And so guess what? Everyone's got to have this fresh start. You got to start all over again, to be born again. And the Greek translation of this is to be born from above, which means you need a God thing to happen in your life if you want to be able to understand and really perceive and enter the kingdom of God. And so it, 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 and you got to understand, this is a really hard thing to do. Because naturally when Jesus says, here's what needs to happen, we think of, well, what's our part? Um, we almost wish the scripture said, for you to see or enter the kingdom of God, what you need to do is, you need to wash yourself. You need to take a bath. You go, great, okay, I know how to do that. All right, great. Like, and then we can do that. But when he says, you got to be born again, you go, well, that's kind of out of my, I, I, I don't, how, how does that work? Which is why Nicodemus responded with the question. He goes, well, well how can someone be born when they are old? Great question, Nicodemus. Nicodemus asked, surely they cannot enter a second time into their mother's womb to be born because that would be weird. <laughs> but nevertheless, Nicodemus is, is, is going, how do you teach an old dog new tricks? I'm, I, I, I'm trying to reconcile what it is that you, you want to do, but I but I'm trying to figure out what my part is because you have to understand for Nicodemus, someone who has risen to the top of the spiritual food chain in Israel, he has done a lot to get there. And so all of a sudden he's being given this idea, this concept that he's going, I can't even wrap my brain around it because I've done so much my whole life to elevate myself, but now you're giving me something that is unattainable to be born again. I cannot go back to mom and have that conversation. That's completely weird. And, and here's what Jesus says in verse 5. He says, Jesus answered, very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the spirit flesh gives birth to flesh, but spirit gives birth to spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the spirit. It's, it's making things worse for Nicodemus. Nicodemus is going, I'm very influential, I'm very prominent, I'm very educated. I, I don't know what in the world you're talking about, Jesus. He's so confused. 
Because he hasn't been given a to-do list. He's been given mission impossible. And Jesus is going, it's only possible by my spirit. This is a spiritual transaction. This is not getting in line to do better. No, this is about a spiritual transformation. So already Jesus is destroying two paradigms for Nicodemus. The first paradigm that he's shattering is just because you're Jewish doesn't mean you're in and you're good. No, you got to be born again. And secondly, you're going to need some help to do it. You're going to need a spiritual transformation to happen on the inside of your soul. And I know sometimes we are looking for our to-do list. We're looking for our practical one, two, three, A, B, C. What do I got to do next? And Jesus is going, historically, how has that worked out for anybody? Here's the deal. Every time we give you rules, guess what? You couldn't even keep 10. So if you can't keep 10, what, like, no, we got to send a pro. We got to send somebody perfect. And then... I love Nicodemus because John chapter 3, verse 9, he says, well, how can this be? That's a great question. From Nicodemus, he's going, I, I'm not sure I understand. And Jesus, kind of a little bit of a smart remark, he goes, you're Israel's teacher, and you do not understand these things. He's going, you're the guy in charge. You're the pastor of the church. Did you go to school on this? To which Nicodemus is going, no, I didn't go to school on this. You know, no one's ever offered to save the universe, but here you are. So, no, I, I, don't, I don't know. What, how, how do I go about teaching this? If you're Nicodemus, you're pretty dejected. It, you're like, I just, I'm the guy that's supposed to give answers to everybody else. And yet, I don't know. And smack dab in the middle of this conversation comes perhaps the number one most memorized Bible verse in all of Scripture. Jesus is going, let me just, Nicodemus, let me, I know you got a lot of questions. I, I know you're trying to figure out a bunch of stuff. I get it. Let me break it down for you really simply. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Hey, Nicodemus, <laughs> you need a lot of help. So does everybody. That's why I volunteer. So that you could get the help to be born again, because you cannot do it on your own. This would have been shocking to Nicodemus. Because it, if Jesus would have said, to enter the kingdom of heaven, Gentiles, non-Jews, they need to be born again. Nicodemus would have been like, that's probably a good idea. I should be Jewish. Uh-huh. Uh, if, 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 if Jesus would have said in John 3, 16, for God so loved Israel, Nicodemus would have been like, yeah, makes sense, makes sense. But as soon as he says, for God so loved the world, Nicodemus, whoa, 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 pump the brakes. What do you mean? Expansion. This is, this is what we're doing. Ladies and gentlemen, it's 26 words. For God so loved the world, he gave his one and only son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. He's going, hey, I, 26 words of hope. If you are new to the faith, this is where you should begin. John 3, 16. Uh, it's broken down like this. Um, he loves. He gave. We believe. We live. If, if, if you're new to the faith, that's where you should start. Yeah, I, I know you're going to have lots of questions. You're going to try and figure out if the flood really happened. You're going to be like, man, I don't understand. You're, like, you're going to have lots and lots of questions. But at the very beginning, this is home plate. This is where we start. He loves. He loves so much he gave. And what happens when we believe in that? We live forever. That's where you should start if, you, if, if you're brand new to the faith. Let's just say you're a veteran. This is where you come back to. Because we can make it about a whole bunch of other things and we can lose sight of exactly what it's all about. 
and coming back to the center, this is, this is what we all should always return back to. John 3, 16. What I love about Nicodemus is that his faith journey doesn't end there. It just it doesn't end with just that conversation in John chapter 7. Verse 43, it says, Thus the people were divided because of Jesus. Some wanted to seize him, but no one laid a hand on him. Verse 45 says, Finally the temple guards went back to the chief priests and the Pharisees who asked them, Why didn't you bring him in? No one ever spoke the way this man does, the guards replied. You mean he has deceived you also? The Pharisees retorted. Have any of the rulers or of the Pharisees believed in him? No, but this mob that knows nothing of the law, there is a curse on them. Verse 50, Nicodemus, who had gone to Jesus earlier and who was one of their own number asked, hey guys, hey guys, just calm down for a second. Does our law condemn a man without first hearing him to find out what he has been doing? They replied, are you from Galilee too? Look into it, and you will find that a prophet does not come out of Galilee. So, <laughs> what's awesome is there is division around Jesus, and Nicodemus is given an assignment like a lawyer. Hey, 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 you go! And look into it yourself. Ladies and gentlemen, if, if you're trying to have a grown-up faith, if, if at some point in your faith journey right now you need to hit a reset button, I encourage you to look into it. Investigate it for yourself. And say, you know what? Not what is church. Not what is religion. Who is Jesus? Who is Jesus? And there's, there's only three stories about Nicodemus. The first two that I just read you in this third one, that's it. And, and, and the journey between the second story and the third, I don't know, but I do know this. He did look into it. Because after Jesus is crucified, John 19 says, Later, Joseph of Arimathea asked Pilate for the body of Jesus. Now Joseph was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly because he feared the Jewish leaders. With Pilate's permission, he came and took the body away. He was accompanied by Nicodemus. The man who earlier had visited Jesus at night. Nicodemus brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds. Taking Jesus' body, the two of them wrapped it with the spices in strips of linen. This was according with Jewish burial customs. Nicodemus may not have understood what it meant to be born again until he was carrying the body of a savior into a tomb. And maybe, just maybe, not until a week later when that same body was walking around town did Nicodemus go, oh, born again. I think I'm starting to understand this Jesus just a little bit. What did Nicodemus do? He looked into it and found himself at the feet of Jesus, at the foot of the cross. And is the first one going, I'm still here. I'm still investigating. And if you were to ask Nicodemus, why does he believe what he believes? He wouldn't tell you, well, because I went to school. And, and, and because I, I just, he goes, no, I, I investigated and guess where it led me? It led me to the foot of the cross. I wrapped my savior and I put him in the tomb and they shut it. And if you go visit it today, he's not there. I had an experience that I that doesn't even, I'm not even sure I fully wrap my brain around it. But all I know is that because he was able to predict his death, burial, and resurrection, I get to be born again. Because what he was explaining to me sounded pretty hard. But when he told me what he would do, I thought that was pretty hard too. And if he can do that, I think he can help me. At some point, I think each and every one of us has to hit reset on our faith and have a Nicodemus-like experience to say, you know what, I, gotta, I know I got a lot of experiences, a lot of hurt, a lot of people turned their back on me, a lot of people talked about me, but at some point, we got to go, but Lord, 
here's the reality, ladies and gentlemen. One day we're going to stand before God and give an account. And here's what I don't want for you. I don't, I don't want this for me. I, let, let's just say Peter, who, who's amazing, okay? Let, let's just say Peter started talking about me behind my back, okay? And I said, you know what? I'm done. I'm done with Chase. I'm out of here. I don't want to be a Christian. And I stood before God. He says, hey, so why'd you give up on the faith? You think I'll be able to go, Pete, it was Pete, Peter. Did you, did Pete, Peter was talking about me, God. So that's why you walked away from me for 10 years? No, but, but, but Peter, he was a hypocrite. So that's, that's why you gave up on your faith. In me? I love Peter, but my faith's not in him. It's in Jesus. And last time I checked, and the last time Jeff checked in Israel, tomb's empty. I like my odds. Um, I'm uh, getting ready to speak on a Tuesday in Chicago at a, uh, at a corporate event. And one of the other speakers reached out to me. And he said, hey, um, I, looked, I looked into you, and I see that you're like a preacher, and yet you do this corporate. How, how do these worlds blend together? I'm just so curious. I'm like, I love these conversations. I love talking to people about how, how we can be of, of, of great influence in corporate America. I'm like, yeah, let, let's have this conversation. And so we, we get on this call, and I was blown away. Um, this was a woman who, she said, hey, I, I'm, I'm, I'm so fascinated by how you, how you do this because she goes, you have to understand, um, I, I just became a Christian. I said, like, when? She goes, you know, like a couple months ago. I went, oh. okay, she said, I had a Pauline-like experience. I said, well, what does that mean? She goes, I've never read the Bible, and, and I've never been to church. She said, I had way too many things in my life that I lost confidence in coincidence, that I said, there must be a God. And so I, I just... I started looking into it, and, and, and this, is, this is a woman who has more degrees than fingers, okay? Like, like, she, like, she's got more letters after her name. Like, this is a really smart person. She goes, I'm an academic, and so I decided to go to the School of Divinity to figure out who God is. I go, well, there's other ways of doing it. That seems a little extreme to me, but I'm just fascinated by your story. Keep talking, okay? And so she goes, so, you know, I, I was reading Matthew, right? So I, I read the Gospel of Matthew, and I'm just going, this is fascinating, because I've read Matthew my whole life. But this is a person in their 40s who's like reading it for the very first time in their life. She goes, you know what my takeaway was? She goes, uh, Ryan, i got to be honest. I don't know if anybody should be rich, because the way Jesus talks about rich people, woo, woo. And I went, yeah, you, 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 you got a point. And she, and she goes, you know, I, I, was, I was reading Genesis this morning. I said, when you say you're reading Genesis this morning, can you explain this? She goes, like, I read the whole thing. <laughs> this morning? <laughs> I said, what have you read in Scripture? She goes, I've only read Genesis and I've only read Matthew. I go, that's it? That's it? She goes, yeah. She goes, Ryan, it's amazing to me. Because, you know, like, she goes, Ryan, do you know the first question that God asked humanity? Where are you? She goes, what a great question. Like, isn't that the question? She goes, do you know the first question that humanity asked God? Am I, my, am I my brother's keeper? Like, we're constantly blaming people. We've been doing it from the beginning. It's his fault. She made me do it. Like, it's like, she goes, Ryan, this, I, I love the Bible. And it was like looking at a kid at a candy store. And I was going, I wish I could trade spots with you. Because she doesn't know. I'm like, you don't, you still have the wonder. <laughs> You don't know if Pharaoh's going to let the people go or not. Like, you're still on the edge of your seat. You're like, I don't know. I don't know. And then they get to the edge of the water, and you're like, oh, they're, they're shook. They're screwed. Like, what are they going to do? And you don't know if the Red Sea's going to part or not because Moses didn't know. He just had to, like, walk around with a stick. He's like, what is this going to do? And bam, it just opens up. I'm like, you don't. You probably think Goliath might win. He doesn't. When Daniel goes and the lion's in, you're like, this guy's about to get eaten. Like, it's over for this guy. I'm just like, you don't. Have you read about Lazarus? Yeah, you don't know that Paul in the middle of prison is still going, I can do all things in Christ who strengthens me. Like, you don't. You, you still got the wonder. And I just, my prayer for us is that in this series, we'd get our wonder back. 
that we would be people that, like Nicodemus, kind of hit that reset button and just begin to open up the scripture again like it's the first time again, like we don't know how the story ends. And I'm just, I hope we can get a fresh faith that is truly ours, not the ones that are that, that, that just our parents handed to us, that we just adopted. And here, our parents are great, our grandparents are great, but here's the deal. If it's not your faith, it will be easily shaken and easily broken. You have to know why you believe what you believe. And I think what each and every one of us can experience is a fresh wonder and a fresh faith approaching the scripture to say, you know what, Jesus, who are you? I realize that a lot of us have had so many different experiences in our life with so many different people and many things can derail our faith. But I just think it's possible that in our 30s and 40s and 50s and 60s and 70s and 80s that you can teach an old dog new tricks, that you can find yourself in a place where there is a spiritual transformation. And I think for each and every one of us, if we approach the scripture and ask the Holy Spirit to do what only he can do, I think we'll get our wonder back. And I think God will reveal things to us and rebuild our faith from the ground up in something that cannot be easily shaken. God, I thank you so much for Chase Oaks. God, I, I pray, God, that we would have a grown-up faith. I pray, God, that you would help us hit a reset button. God, I pray that you would refresh us. God, I pray that you would bring back our wonder. God, may we come back to home plate, that you loved us so much that you gave. And when we believe, we can truly live. And God, I pray that we wouldn't make things more complicated than that and when we have our questions that we would bring them to you in Jesus name we pray everybody said amen, amen.